Uh, my pleasure to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for this afternoon. You'll also notice that as I'm no longer the keynote speaker, I'm looking a little more beach-like since this morning. Um, it, it's been really my great pleasure in life to know Barry Bame just a, a little bit. I certainly knew of him a long time before I ever met him, having come through university studying software engineering. And therefore, it was really a stunning event in my life in very early 2004 to receive an email in my inbox um, from Barry Bame saying that he'd read my first book and he was impressed enough with it that he'd like to invite me to USC uh, to give a talk at his research review. Barry, um, you're sort of semi-retired now. What, what's your official position with the, the CSSE? You're still full-time. So uh, Barry is a professor for the uh, Center for uh, Systems and Software Engineering at USC. He's perhaps the only person in the software profession who's had a book with the title Barry Bame's Lifetime Contribution to Software Engineering published while he's still around to tell us all about it. And it's a very thick book as well. Um, you'll know about some of Barry's work from a long time ago, the cost of change curve that gets bashed so heavily by the agile people. Uh, th that was Barry's stuff in 1977. He published Software Engineering Economics in 1981. And the great conclusion of that book is that the biggest leverage in improving the performance of software engineering is improving the managers. And here we are, 34 years later, and we still haven't figured out how to do that. So more recently, Barry's work and his research team at, at uh, USC, they've been looking at complexity and on, and on very large scale and trying to solve the problem, what do you do with an Air Force major who's retiring out of the service, being given a desk job, and instead of flying a plane for a living, is now being asked to run a $40 million IT procurement for the federal government in this new, very complex environment. So when I ran into them, again in 2009, they were doing a lot of research on real option theory and deferred commitment. And what came out of that is something called the incremental commitment model. And here to tell us all about it and to tell us a little bit about some of the research that they've been doing in Kanban, please welcome Barry Bame. So uh, yeah, at the beginning of chapter two of David's uh, Kanban book, uh, he recounts the use of Kanban in the uh, Japanese imperial uh, palace gardens. How many people recall that? So uh, I, I've always thought of that as a really good, simple, visual explanation of what Kanban is all about. Uh, last November, I had a, a conference in Tokyo and took my daughter along. Uh, and I went to the Imperial College uh, Gardens with her. And uh, as with David, uh, I went to the beginning of the, uh, uh, the, the gate, and uh, they gave me uh, a Kanban part card for myself and one for my daughter, and uh, it still works the same way, David. And uh, the only difference was that with David, it was his three-month three uh, daughter that was getting it. With my daughter, she was 47 years old. So, uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of insight from uh, a lot of the things that David has done. Uh, uh, some of which uh, in the areas like liquidity, I, I think, uh, give an example of uh, extending Kanban to uh, address situations where you, uh, you're you getting a peak in, in, in some workload and, and you need to expand something. And, and uh, so uh, uh, buying some liquidity is, is, is something that's, that's worth doing. Uh, so uh, yeah, one of the things that uh, uh, the, the name of this talk is, is Avoiding the Procrustean Bed with the Incremental Commitment Spiral Model. And uh, I will talk about what a, what a Procrustean Bed is and who Procrustes was and uh, 
try to relate that to the incremental commitment spiral model. Uh, 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 at the uh, book exhibit, uh, uh, there's the book about the incremental commitment spiral model. So uh, if you want to get into more detail, it's it's there. So so uh, let's see. Uh, is there a clicker or something? Okay. So. Uh, uh, the, the Procrustean bread is, is really something that is, uh, 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 I'll, I'll explain in the next chart, but uh, it fits uh, one size fits all process models. Next chart. Oh, okay, so I just do that. Okay, so Procrustes is with a rogue uh, Smith and, and Bandit, and uh, uh, he had a hostel on, on the way between Athens and Delphi, and uh, it had one bed, bed in it, and uh, basically what he would do is uh, fit the guests to the bed. And if you were too small, he would stretch you until you fit, and if you were too large, he would lop off the offending parts. And uh, so uh, uh, basically, uh, in the software world, we, we do a lot of building our own Procrustean beds. So, so we've just uh, talked about pure waterfall things where uh, uh, you use a fixed price, uh, fixed specification contract, and any good new idea that comes in, you lop it off as requirements creep. Uh, 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 pure Agile, we, we just... Uh, heard Craig Strong talk about Scrum, and, and that uh, if you try to do it exactly the way it's, it's uh, presented in the Scrum book, uh, uh, you, you find some unpleasant surprises. Or if you uh, uh, take uh, Kent Beck's extreme programming that says do all 12 practices, they fit together like a Swiss watch, you find that they don't sometimes, most of the time. Uh, I'll, I'll show some other examples. Uh, uh, one is listen to the voice of the customer. I'll show an example where they listened and, and got into big trouble. Uh, uh, I was once involved in a uh, National Research Council review of uh, uh, what to do about the ADA programming language, and, and we went around uh, seeing what people's experiences were with it, and uh, it wasn't the language, it, it was the way the programs were managed and, and the uh, dictates that came out, that uh, basically this used a mill standard that said you have to use the waterfall, which means that the requirements determine the capabilities. Uh, the, the next Secretary of Defense came out with a memo that says you've got to use COTS. Well, with COTS, the COTS capabilities determine the requirements, and, and so this, you get into uh, what do we do now? Uh, the ADA mandate said you have to program everything in ADA. Well, most. COTS products didn't have ADA bindings. Uh, and, and this one had uh, some government off-the-shelf software that was also incompatible. So, so there's other ways that you can get into Procrustean beds. Uh, I, I was also the uh, co-sponsor of a mill standard 498, which was uh, uh, something that was getting rid of the waterfall, we thought. Uh, and one of the ways we thought we would do it is, is to uh, give people a choice of the data item descriptions that they'd use. If you were a complex project, you, you'd use all 23. If you were a medium size, you would, you'd use six. And if you were simple, you'd use one. Uh, and what we uh, ran into was the Pentagon uh, uh, process and, and policy police who said, uh, you can't have uh, more than one uh, standard that covers the same topic. And so we had to go with 23, and uh, basically, uh, yeah, we we're just talking about the, uh, the major who uh, uh, becomes a, uh, a program manager for a large IT program, uh, and he's got these 23 uh, data item descriptions, and uh, he has the choice of tailoring them down. Well, he, he doesn't know about whether they're needed or not, but to be safe, he keeps all 23. And uh, again, you get into a lot of wasted effort. To, uh, over constrained maturity models. Uh, yeah, the, the first uh, software capability maturity models, first uh, uh, process area was uh, requirements management, and the first practice said, uh, 
Uh, determining the requirements is not the province of the software people, but is a prerequisite for their work. Well, nowadays, software is 90% of most products, and not letting the software people be par participating in, in the requirements is a pretty uh, goofy thing to do. Um, here's, here's the classic uh, DOD acquisition process, which is uh, the, the best Procrustean bed that, uh, that I've been able to find so far. So yeah, what, what does the incremental commitment spiral model try to do about this? Uh, Basically, uh, <clears throat> it is a risk-driven framework for determining and evolving your best fit system life cycle process. So it says there, there's uh, no one-size-fits-all process that's going to work for everything. Uh, and one of the things that I've liked about the Kanban presentations here is that there, there's no one-size-fits-all Kanban. People are in, inventing various ways to address per, uh, special situations. Uh, what it tries to do is integrate the, the strengths of, of phased models that, that say you have to uh, get to a certain point and make some decisions about what you do next, and, and risk-driven spiral models. Uh, uh, what it says is that uh, uh, principles trump diagrams. That, uh, the biggest problem with the original spiral model was that, that people would uh, uh, not read the paper that described it, but would take the diagram and, and reinterpret it in, in whatever way they, they were interested in. Uh, we've got uh, four principles, which later on I'll show are very close to the uh, seven lean principles that, uh, that are at least one of the sets of the lean principles. It uh, says, uh, you ought to take your guidance from all of your success critical stakeholders, not just the voice of the customer, but the voice of the maintainer, the voice of the supplier and the distributor and the, and the angel investor and, and whoever else is critical to your success. Uh, uh, you should commit incrementally, and uh, commitment means commitment. It means you're accountable for this. Uh, 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 concurrent... Uh, uh, means that uh, uh, basically uh, uh, the, the model is now extended so that it includes uh, not just software but hardware and, and, and uh, people within the system and uh, uh, that you're concurrently uh, determining the ops concept, the requirements, the architecture, the plans, the, the budgets and schedules and, and all the rest and making sure that they all fit together. and. Uh, uh, the way you make decisions is that uh, uh, you, uh, you identify, uh, as all of these are being uh, concurrently engineered, uh, uh, what's the evidence that, that they'll all fit together. Uh, and uh, again, shortfalls in evidence are uncertainties. Uncertainties are probabilities of loss. Probability of loss uh, times size, size of loss, as Larry Mascheroni was saying this morning, is risk. So, uh, so basically, uh, if your stakeholders are hurrying up to uh, meet a market window, you're willing to accept a lot of risk. If you're doing something safety critical, you're not le you're less uh, willing to uh, accept certain kinds of risks. Uh, so, uh, so here here's what it looks like, and. Uh, uh, what it uh, uh, does is to, uh, in the upper left there, uh, say that you're, you're, what you're doing as you're expanding the spiral is uh, in improving your cumulative level of understanding of the product and the process, uh, and that you're doing this by concurrently engineering these. and. Uh, uh, what you're trying to do when you get around to the end of the spiral uh, is that you're not just getting a whole bunch of UML diagrams and PowerPoint charts. Uh, uh, you're pr producing evidence that if you build it to those uh, 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 UML diagrams using that, that process, here's the evidence that it would uh, satisfy the operational concept. Uh, uh, meet the requirements uh, and be buildable within the budgets and the schedules and the plan. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is something that becomes a first-class deliverable. Uh, it's something that is uh, 
uh, that the developers are paid to produce and is uh, reviewed by independent experts. And, and again, shortfalls are uncertainties and risks. So uh, as you go around the exploration phase, you, you get to uh, uh, milestone one there. And uh, uh, it's expanded at, down at the lower left. And it basically says, uh, if your risks are acceptable, uh, uh, then, then you go into the, uh, the, the valuation phase and, uh, uh, and do a business case and, and elaborate the, the requirements and the solutions and, and the like. Uh, uh, if the risks are high but addressable, uh, suppose this is a safety critical system and you haven't done any safety cases, uh, you may want to do those before you commit to this particular architecture. Uh, uh, if it's too high or unaddressable, uh, basically, if, if you get there and you were, you were uh, expecting to be first to market, then by this time, uh, three people are already in the marketplace and have captured 80% of the market share, uh, maybe you want to save your, uh, your dollars for, for the next project or retarget it to a mobile platform or something that makes it more competitive. Uh, and in some cases, uh, 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 if the risks are negligible, if, uh, if you're building a, a simple uh, application to keep track of, uh, of your research projects and, and you're uh, building it on, on top of, uh, of Oracle and, and uh, you've built more complex things on, uh, than this before, uh, then there's no risk that this thing is not, gonna, that Oracle is not going to be able to support it and there's no risk that you can't afford to buy Oracle because you've already bought it. Uh, so uh, in those cases, you can skip, combine or skip some of the inter intermediate phases and, and go ahead and, and, and uh, do an agile approach. Hmm. So uh, again, uh, yeah, what, uh, what we tried to do with the, with, with the incremental commitment version was to extend it to uh, hardware and, and, and people factors, and, and again, uh, concurrently exploring needs, opportunities, uh, engineering the hardware and the software and the, the uh, human system integration inter interfaces, and, and, and stabilize all this concurrency uh, by having these, these anchor point milestones where you'd uh, review evidence and see whether you're ready to proceed or not. And again, this was something that uh, was in, uh, done in response to primarily the uh, uh, Pentagon saying, we've, we've uh, uh, issued a, a, uh, a DOD uh, instruction 5000.02 that says everybody is going to do spiral development, but we can't figure out what it is. And, uh, so uh, so uh, again, we came out with a phased version that fit uh, their milestone A and B and, and, and things like that. Uh, uh, a little later, I got involved in a National Research Council study that was called Human System Integration in the System Development Process. And uh, came up with a, a more spiral version of it, uh, which uh, uh, I was the only process person, and the, the, the other 14 people on the study were experts in, in, in human interfaces. And they said, that, that's not a very good, uh, uh, understandable uh, uh, diagram. And uh, with all of their help, we, we uh, created the things with the multiple arrows that said, yeah, basically, in a lot of cases, you, the, you, there, there's not just one path through the, uh, the, the life cycle. Uh, at any point, you have four decisions, four possible ways to go around. And, and so there's a lot of different ways, and, and your risks determine uh, which way you're going to end up going. Uh, so uh, again, uh, uh, this is something that we found uh, uh, we could pick good things from most of the current process models. And um, uh, one thing that we also have done is to create an electronic process guide using the rational method composer so that it's uh, relatively easy to see how to navigate it. So uh, what, what's incremental commitment all about? Uh, uh, 
Uh, how, how many of you, if you go down to one of the casinos around here and you have a choice of playing roulette or poker or blackjack, uh, how many people would prefer to play roulette? There's a couple back there. Uh, uh, how many pr pr prefer to play poker or back blackjack? A lot more. Quite a few know the rules of probability and didn't raise your hand at all. Uh, but for those of you that pr picked roulette, uh, do you have a, a rationale for it? Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Instant gratification, right. Well, the, the other reason that I've heard uh, said is that I, I just love the rush when I'm totally out of control of my destiny and, <laughs> and I'm just waiting to see uh, what that little white ball is going to do, which is what you see in a lot of software procurements. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so again, with, with poker and blackjack, uh, you put a few chips in, you get to see a few cards, you get to see some of your competitors' cards, and, uh, and, and basically you can decide, yeah, do we want to push a, look, a few more chips in and, and uh, see some more cards, or uh, do you have a terrible hand and you fold and save your chips for the next one? Uh, uh, so uh, that's a, a good example. Uh, 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 this is another view of the, uh, uh, the, the model, which, uh, how many people are familiar with the Philippe Krustin Rational uh, Unified Process Hump Diagram? Yeah, so the, this is an expanded version of this that says there, there are a lot of things that you, you want to do concurrently. Uh, uh, you you want to explore opportunities, you want to uh, determine you know, how, how big a thing should we ta be taking on, you need to understand the, the needs of all the success critical stakeholders, and, and you want to get a, uh, uh, a eventually get to a set of requirements, but uh, you don't want to call them requirements before you're still exploring them. You call them opportunities or, or, or uh, uh, options or, or uh, objectives or, or things like that. Uh, and, and you want to uh, uh, come up with a consistent architecture of the system and its hardware and software and and uh, and, uh, and, and uh, human factors, and and you want to come up with a plan. You want to come up with a a, a budget and schedule and and the like, and and you want to get uh, 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 the the various stakeholders to negotiate uh, something that is not. Uh, what every any of you any of them want desire, but is something that uh, leaves them all in a better situation than they're currently in. So, uh, so uh, again, uh, once you have that, uh, the other thing that you do is to determine this evidence and, and review the evidence to see whether it uh, tells you to go get more evidence or to proceed or or to uh, fold and, and save your chips for the for the next deal. Uh, so uh, again, one of the uh, risks in doing this is that you, you've got lots of different people going down lots of different paths, and, and uh, you could end up with all sorts of incompatible stuff. So uh, the, the role of the evidence is that uh, uh, it, it's provided by the developer, it's validated by independent experts, and it says, yeah, if the system is built to this architecture, here's the evidence that it will satisfy the capability requirements, the interface requirements, the illities or levels of service, and, and the evolution requirements that say, eventually this thing has got to scale up to handle 10,000 people, and uh, don't uh, uh, do an agile thing that says, let's, uh, uh, let's make the department succeed by doing, uh, uh, picking a, a COTS product and, and finding that it doesn't scale up to 10,000 people. Um, uh, uh, support the operational concept, be buildable within the budget and schedule in the plan, generate a viable return on investment, and generate satisfactory outcomes for all the success critical stakeholders. So again, uh, uh, you can't uh, uh, hardly ever uh, uh, get complete evidence of, of feasibility, so there will be uh, shortfalls in the evidence, and 
Uh, those are uncertainties or probabilities of loss, which times size of loss is risk exposure. So, so basically what you do is uh, uh, present the evidence and the, and the risks to the stakeholders. And uh, again, if they're uh, uh, risk uh, uh, aver aversion people, then, uh, then yeah, you probably are going to want to do more homework to keep them happy. Uh, uh, if they're, uh, they're risk accepting, uh, then the, they're willing to take the risks and go, go forward. Uh, so what this does is, is not just uh, give you a sound basis for proceeding, but it synchronizes and stabilizes all these concurrent activities. Uh, well, one of the things that uh, uh, we, we found uh, helped uh, in, in a lot of uh, projects that was that uh, they were having problems with, with rapid change. And uh, again, uh, as uh, Greg Strong was saying with, with his Scrum project, yeah, that there, there's uh, a lot of, of uh, volatility in, in software intensive projects. And uh, if your people are trying to develop the system on a, a tight schedule, and, and all this change traffic comes in that they're trying to figure out, well, how does that fit with our current architecture? How, how, how do we uh, refactor? What do we refactor? And, and do we really want to refactor? Uh, uh, and so uh, what this says is that uh, a good way to handle rapid change is, uh, for one, to foresee as much of it as possible and, and build it into design patterns and, and things like that so that it's easy to adapt to whatever the changes are. Uh, but in, in a lot of situations, there's unforeseeable change, and, and if you feed that into the people that are on a tight schedule, you're going to get into big trouble. So uh, what we found works pretty well is to, uh, either within the team or outside the team, to have an, uh, an, a bunch of agile people that are handling this change traffic and uh, uh, determining uh, 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 as uh, David was saying in, in this morning, uh, 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 do, you, do you want to uh, uh, accept the change? Uh, uh, do, you, do you want to uh, uh, drop it, uh, or, or do you want to defer it until later? So in the medical field, this is called triage. And, and so uh, what we have in uh, uh, In, uh, uh, in, uh, as a sort of a process model for what the Agile team does is, is something that is, is very much like Kanban. That, uh, uh, you, over on the right-hand side, you have some change proposals. Uh, here, 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 here's a proposed change that uh, we, we want this to uh, operate on mobile platforms as well as desktops. Uh, whoops, uh, that, that's a pretty big change. Uh, uh, so uh, the Agile team uh, assesses the change and, uh, and proposes handling it. So if it's a, a relatively easy change that uh, fits within the design patterns and, and the like, uh, you feed it over to the stabilized development team and they uh, negotiate whether they, they, they can fit it into their current schedule or not. And uh, if they can, they, they uh, can accept the change and, and go forward with it. But other than that, they, they put it back in, in the, uh, 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 assess the, uh, uh, the impact of this change uh, uh, by the Agile uh, rebaselining team. And, and they decide, uh, yeah, is this something that uh, uh, we need to do, but uh, we, we can't do in the current one, so we, we need to rebaseline what we said we were going to do in the next increment and uh, reprioritize the features, or uh, say, well, this was a wonderful idea, but uh, it doesn't really fit our current business model. And uh, uh, so let's stick it in the parking lot, and maybe it will become more important later. So, so again, there are these three outcomes that. Uh, uh, that are, are well suited to a Kanban kind of approach. It says, yeah, here come all these changes, and then let's, uh, let's uh, uh, determine uh, what to do with them. Uh, yeah, the electronic process guide is something that we uh, use 15 to 20 times a year when we uh, uh, teach uh, 
students software engineering by having them build real software for real uh, USC neighborhood clients. Some are on campus, some are local government, some are community social services, some are uh, local small businesses. And so you have teams of six people that uh, get together with a client who has written a two paragraph uh, description of what they want, and they have to uh, 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 learn uh, how to, uh, uh, how to uh, relate that to what they know what to do in, in, in programming. So they have to visit the client site and see how they work and, and what they need and, and what kind of software will help them. And they need to uh, uh, do business case analyses. They, they, they need to negotiate uh, requirements and, uh, and the like. So uh, it, it's uh, like the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, inverted process that, yeah, basically we do this as a foundation stone uh, for the uh, uh, bachelors in computer science who come in uh, to get a master's degree rather than a capstone that they do at the end. So that uh, after they've done this project, they really understand the theory and the architecture courses a lot better. So uh, let, let's look at the, the principles and, uh, and see how they fit with uh, Lean and Kanban. And, and also we've been, uh, 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 another thing that we uh, uh, are involved in is the Defense Department System Engineering Research Center, which uh, basically does a lot of research for uh, things that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Department of Defense wants to uh, understand better. So, so we have a project right now that is analyzing uh, how, how can you apply Kanban to a complex system of systems that is, has got Army systems and Navy systems and Air Force systems and space systems. And, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll say a bit about that and then uh, the four principles are, are good, but uh, I think there are a couple of final meta, meta principles that I will end with. Uh, so uh, principles trump diagrams. So here, here's an, some examples of things that people have called the spiral model and tried to manage to. I don't know how they managed to most of them, but uh, uh, an interesting exercise is to go and Google on spiral process images, and you'll, you'll be amazed at how many uh, artistic licenses people have made to it. But again, none of these say anything about stakeholders or commitments or concurrency or risk. So again, uh, yeah, uh, here, here are the four, oh, uh, another good example of uh, PowerPoint and, and various kinds of interpretations of it. Uh, principle one, two, one, one, and two are <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, we, we, we've talked about the four of them. What I will do is, is give a counterexample uh, and, and a good example. So, uh, the counterexample was the Bank of America's Masternet project, uh, which uh, uh, basically Bank of America was uh, the first real pioneer in uh, applying computer technology to banking and in doing electronic check, check, check processing. Uh, by the 1980s, they, they had drifted and, and gotten way behind the, uh, the competing banks in terms of electronics, and their CEO said, uh, we are going to vault over everybody and, and build the system for the 90s, and, and we're going to uh, do this by uh, doing everything in a network-based approach, and, and we're going to uh, reinvent our trust management system. And so uh, what they did was to, uh, again, listen to the voice of the customer, and they took all of their current trust management system users and said, uh, uh, what would you like to see in, the, in our next generation futuristic trust management system. And, uh, and again, uh, everybody had a bunch of wish lists and said, well, yeah, uh, if I said I wanted this, uh, what would you do? Well, we'd add it to the requirements. Well, they had, at the end, three and a half million lines of code worth of requirements. And they had a budget of $22 million, and that's $3 an instruction. Uh, 
and um, and nine months to do it in. And and uh, and again, they they had publicized this and said we've got to go forward to it with it. Uh, so, uh, uh, but again, uh, what they found was that uh, 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 most uh, most people's value propositions vary by by role, and and uh, 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 the, the users have different value propositions than the acquirers and, and the developers and, and the maintainers, and all those red lines are clashes between these value propositions. So the users want a lot of features. Uh, they want to change their mind about the features anytime they want. Uh, uh, they, they want uh, uh, compatibility with their previous, uh, their existing systems. They want uh, instant response and 24-7 availability. Uh, and, and, and so on and so on. So uh, again, the acquirers have got nine months and $22 million. That's not gonna fit three and a half million lines of, 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 uh, of many features. Uh, so uh, what the acquirers did was to uh, go around and say, yeah, can we find somebody who has built a trust management system that might scale up to what we're trying to do and do most of the work for us? And, uh, they found a company called Premier Systems, which had built several uh, successful trust management systems for smaller banks, and, and so they went with them, uh, and um, uh, basically uh, found that uh, uh, the, the uh, value propositions for the developers were that uh, uh, they, 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 they could reuse anything that they already had. So what they already had was uh, something that ran on prime computers using prime OS and, and uh, 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 C language. And, and uh, basically, Bank of America was an IBM COBOL mainframe organization. So, so again, the maintainers said, this is not a win for us. So the, even the users said, this is not a win for us. So, uh, uh, so but, and, and unfortunately, they didn't put anything in the contract that was incentives to get it done well, get it done at all, uh, uh, get it done on schedule. And, and so uh, at the end of nine months and $22 uh, 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 million, dollars, uh, they had 100 programmers busy programming things, uh, but they were nowhere near done and no, no, no indication that it would ever integrate. And, and the prime computers, uh, the biggest one had eight MIPS, and, and that was not a lot uh, to do three, million, three and a half million lines of code with a lot of different uh, users. And uh, so uh, basically, they kept trying and trying. And, and four years later, uh, uh, after spending $88 million, they, they declared failure. And so, so uh, again, uh, if you look at uh, uh, stakeholder value-based guidance, yeah, over, over concern with the voice of the customer, no concern with the maintainers, the interoperators, uh, 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 no incremental commitment. It was, yeah, go to it, Premier Systems, build us this thing. Uh, no award fees or penalties for uh, overruns. Uh, 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 concurrent multidiscipline in engineering, uh, they didn't, uh, uh, even try to prioritize the features and then develop them incrementally. Uh, they didn't prototype any operational scenarios and, and usage. Uh, and, and again, they, they didn't do any serious evaluation of, of premier systems. Part of this wasn't the organization's fault. The Bank of America reorganized and took all their system engineers and put them into corporate system engineering, so they didn't have anybody to check what uh, premier systems could really do. Uh, uh, and so, uh, basically, uh, that's a, a good negative example. Uh, uh, here, here's a positive example that came up during this uh, uh, National Research Council Human Systems Integration Study that uh, uh, Abbott Laboratories uh, uh, was uh, the first to develop a multi-channel uh, medical infusion pump. And uh, as you can see there, it's uh, a fairly complex thing uh, as far as the hardware is concerned. Uh, it's a fairly complex thing in terms of, of user interfaces. Uh, uh, one of the choices they had to make was if you want to do a black and white display that is less expensive, 
or do you want one with colors so that uh, if there's air in, 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 in one of the uh, channels that, uh, that it uh, tells you that in red and then uh, and also sounds an alarm and, and uh, so that you can uh, uh, save, the, save the patient. Uh, so uh, fundamentally what they did was uh, uh, an, an exploration phase that uh, 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 again, uh, said, yeah, what, 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 who are the, who are the stakeholders? And they, they weren't just doctors and nurses, they were hospital administrators and insurance companies and, and all sorts of people and, and doing field observations saying, yeah, uh, how, how are we doing these now? Uh, doing some initial user interface prototypes. So it, it's a non-trivial job uh, uh, to have uh, a doctor or a nurse say, uh, program several channels that say, yeah, use this medicine at full strength for five minutes and then tail down over the next 10 minutes. And, and so how, how do you uh, program that uh, with a, uh, a touch screen? Uh, 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 they, they looked to see what Johnson & Johnson and some of their competitors were doing and, and scoping out. Know, what should they try to do? Should they try to do a six channel pump or a four or a two and then decided let's start with two and, and uh, not take up on too much complexity at once and 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 found that yeah they were in a good competitive position uh, they they their uh, things looked feasible to proceed and so they committed so so again uh, the valuation phase uh, uh, they did a lot more uh, interaction with uh, with the prospective users and and uh, evaluated various features and prioritize them into what would be an initial operational capability. Uh, uh, basically had the display vendors pr uh, prototype what they could do in, in terms of uh, uh, black and white versus color and, and uh, user programming uh, with a touch screen and, and the like and uh, doing a top level life cycle plan and, and business case analysis that said, yeah, how are we going to do spare parts and all the other kind of things that are part of the life cycle. And, and again, this is a medical system that is life critical and, and so they had to do a lot of safety assessments and, and the like and, and uh, there was a bunch of business risks that uh, if, if they tried to do things that were too ambitious, uh, they might miss the market window. So. So again, uh, they uh, uh, scaled back on, on some of the more ambitious things that they might have tried to do and, and committed to proceed. Yep. So uh, uh, the, the, the foundations phase is basically uh, uh, the, the quote that we have on, uh, in the uh, uh, in the chapter on, on the foundation phase is, is from the book of Matthew, and it says that uh, a foolish man built a house on sand, and when the storms came, it all got uh, washed away. A wise man built his uh, house on a rock, and the storms came, and it stayed there. So, uh, so basically, what you're trying to do with the foundations is to build uh, the system on a foundation of, of uh, of rocks versus sand, and uh, uh, so you're uh, uh, trying to figure out, yeah, how 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 to uh, modularize the pumping channels, uh, uh, doing safety features, prototyping, and so they they came up with some with some alarms that were really uh, effective at getting the nurses' attentions, but. Uh, 60% uh, of the nurses said, if you put that in the hospital, I'll quit. <laughs> so so uh, uh, um, bad. Uh, uh, programmable theory types and touch screen analysis, failure modes and effects analyses, prototype usage in a teaching hospital, and, and again, uh, having enough evidence that they were on the right track to proceed into development. Even during development, though, there were more things that said, yeah, here, here, here are some criteria that uh, uh, at least 90% of the nurses after one day of training should be able to do the following things. And, and uh, having failure modes and effects analyses and safety analyses and uh, finding a, uh, a, a machine that uh, uh, did a pretty good uh, job of simulating a patient and, and uh, having people 
uh, feed it uh, medications and drugs and, uh, and the like to see what would happen. Uh, and again, uh, after these things, they did uh, have some concerns to adapt to, but uh, were committing to production and, and, and business plans. So in this case, uh, yeah, in terms of stakeholder va value-based guidance, uh, uh, they extensively involved the users, the buyers, the funders, the regulators, uh, did a lot of prototyping, safety analyses. Uh, uh, they did this incrementally, so they, they didn't try to define the, all the details at once. They, they did the, uh, uh, the, the high risk kind of things and, and bought information to reduce risk uh, and decided to do composable one and two cham channel pumps if somebody needed a three or four channel pump. Uh, they, they could gang these together. Uh, uh, they, they concurrently evaluated the displays and the alarms and, and the pump suppliers and, and defined the safety and business cases. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, did a very good job of, of reviewing, having independent people review all, all the safety cases and the business cases and the like. And, and they, they would find risks and, and say, okay, uh, uh, well, we see that there are some further safety cases we need to do. Uh, we don't have all the data for them now, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, that's uh, 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 good enough to have a risk mitigation plan that says we'll do them in the next phase. So uh, if you look at those four principles and, and you look at uh, at least one of the sets of seven lean principles, stakeholder value-based guidance is basically saying, see the whole, look at all the stakeholders, uh, empower the team, the developers are stakeholders too. Uh, incremental commitment and, and accountability, amplify learning, decide as late as possible, uh, concurrent dis multidiscipline, you know, deliver as fast as possible, and again, empower the team. Uh, Evidence and risk-driven decisions, yeah, building integrity in and, and eliminating things that you find there are, are waste. So uh, one of the other things that we've been doing is uh, uh, for the Defense Department doing some uh, simulations of uh, uh, applying uh, Kanban and, and uh, uh, representative interdependent systems of systems that have ongoing change traffic and uh, comparing if you uh, uh, used a Kanban approach, a land last in first out, or a, a random uh, uh, prioritization. So, so the uh, uh, we have a a professor and a grad student that were. Uh, uh, defining this and, and the grad student has uh, developed the, uh, the simulator that uh, basically has a scenario configurator and a, and a simulator configurator and, and basically you, you put, put scenarios in, you do the simulation, you do a lot of Monte Carlos and the, and the like and, uh, and the, uh, the things that come out as results uh, 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 basically, the, the, the red line at the top is, is the, the, the uh, Kanban uh, approach. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, uh, green line in the middle is last in, first out, and, and the uh, black line at, at the bottom is, is uh, a value neutral, uh, pick the next thing randomly. So, so what you can see is, is that the Kanban thing uh, generates value more rapidly, and you can't see it quite as well, but it, it uh, finishes more quickly. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the things you find if you look at the number of suspended tasks is that last in, in first out is not a very good thing, that uh, as soon as a new uh, last in comes in, uh, the things that it's displacing are just sitting there or suspended for quite a long time. Uh, in terms of total time spent, uh, uh, the Kanban system comes in considerably faster than the value neutral and, and the last in first out. And in terms of effort, uh, that there's a, a uh, a required effort if there were no interruptions, but uh, again, the Kanban comes out considerably ahead of the, the other two uh, 
in terms of additional effort it takes to uh, adapt. Uh, so two uh, uh, meta principles. Uh, one, one of the things that I think everybody has challenges with is, is how much is enough of all these different things you do on a software project. You scope it, you plan it, you prototype it, you add cost products, you uh, uh, elaborate requirements, you provide spare capacity, et cetera, et cetera. How, how much is enough on all these? Uh, and what we found is that uh, uh, you can do even uh, subjectively a pretty good job of saying, yeah, what, what's the risk of doing uh, too little prototyping? Uh, well, uh, uh, we, we may miss some, some really important special cases, uh, or we, we, may, not, we may, may find that things don't scale or don't satisfy the users very well. Uh, what's the risk of doing too much? Uh, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you, know, you run into analysis paralysis, and, or uh, I love my simulator more than I love my uh, project. Uh, uh, the, the final metaphorism is, is that uh, uh, the choice of people trumps everything else. Uh, 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 basically, that's one good thing about the Agile Manifesto. It says individuals and interactions are, are more important than processes and tools. Uh, uh, Bill Curtis ran this study for the Microsoft uh, Electronics and Computer Corporation, uh, uh, studying 19 large projects, and the critical success factor was something called the keeper of the holy vision. And this is somebody who, and when anything came up, this, this person seemed to know what impact that was going to have on different parts of, of the, the system under construction. Uh, I had the fortune of, of working for Simon Ramo and, and uh, basically developing an education program for master's people who uh, get uh, scholarships at, uh, at uh, USC and UCLA. And he said, yeah, I, I don't want uh, whole super programmers. I, I want T-shaped people. Uh, I, I want them to be good at software, but I want them to be good at hardware, peopleware, economics, and, and the application domain. So, so uh, again, I think uh, um, uh, that's one of the things that we try to do with our students who come in as I-shaped CS majors, and we try to make them more T-shaped when they come out. So, so I think that uh, covers, oh, 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 in terms of people, uh, one of the things that you can do is, is to say, oh, uh, people, some people are good at some things and not so good at others. So, uh, some people are very good at, if you give them something to do and don't bother them, they get that done on time. Um, so uh, if you have short, stabilized developments of, of small increments, uh, these are the kind of people you want to do that. And you, you don't want to give them a user interface that has a lot of pop-up windows that distract them. Uh, 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 you, you have some people who are really uh, uh, frustrated if they have to do the same thing. Uh, but are great at, at uh, exploring uh, what ifs if, if, if change traffic comes in. And you have some people that uh, uh, really uh, uh, aren't all that good at, uh, at programming and, and, and uh, uh, what ifing, but they're very good at critiquing. And, and so the, these are the people that you want on your verification and validation team. And the ones that are good at all three, these are going to be your chief engineers and future leaders. So, uh, so uh, again, I think uh, 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 the people that are here uh, are, are people who are, uh, as far as I can see, uh, uh, looking at new ways of doing things, are, are <coughs> have a lot of good experience and, and know what they, they don't want. And, and uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I've really been stimulated at all, all the good ideas that have been coming out and good experiences here. So thank you very much. Thank you.